every morning we wake up, more importantly, every Sunday that we wake up and the first gathering is here at church, that there is no better place to be, to hear, to be here, to bless the Lord as a community of believers, worshiping him in spirit and in truth. Amen. With that, please stand for the reading of God's word. Psalm 103, verses 15 through 22. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works in all the places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, church. It's good to come together to worship the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Yeah. 
Amen. How many of you know that God is good this morning? And so therefore, uh, it is good, it is right, it is fitting. The only proper response to who God is, is to praise him. Amen. Well, if you haven't done so already, I've been asked to encourage you to skew in toward the middle of the aisle. As you know, uh, we have more and more people, and we are, all of us, praying that the Lord would grant us more space if that be his will. Amen? Amen. So we'll go ahead and please scoot in. Thank you. In a moment, we will proceed in worship through the pastoral prayer, the giving of our free will offerings, and the partaking of the Lord's table. But before that, I would like to officially welcome any of you who may be visiting with us. This may be your first time or maybe you've been coming here for a few weeks, but either way, we want to thank God for 
the guest that, that he has brought us this morning. We believe with every fiber of our being that there are a lot of places you could be, but in the Lord's sovereign providence, he has brought you here to redeem South Bay to worship this morning. Now, uh, we often say, those of you who are here every week, you know how it goes, we love you enough to, we love you enough to tell you the truth. And so if you're visiting with us, we hope that you find that to be true. And the truth is, is that the truth hurts sometimes, doesn't it? But that's all right. Because if we understand that, we also know that it's the truth that will set us free. Specifically, the truth is that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The truth is that you and I have rebelled against God and that you and I deserve the righteous punishment of God. That's the truth, and that truth is hard to receive, but that's not all the truth. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. The truth is also this, that Jesus, who is the way and the truth and the life, came into this world to save sinners. Amen? And so we hope that you find that we do love you enough to tell you the truth, that you would believe with the fullness of heart that God's word is truth, and oh, how that we would receive the whole counsel of God's word and live in light of it. That said, after I lead us in a time of pastoral prayer, we'll collect offerings and we'll partake of the Lord's table. An offering tray will be passed down the aisle. And that tray will have a double stacked cup. Uh, The the juice and the bread will be in there. So if you would grab that, hold on to those elements, and I will lead us in a time of communion. You're invited to partake of the Lord's table if you are on this day trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you express that trust in and through water baptism. If you're not yet a baptized believer, we kindly ask you to let the elements pass by and we strongly encourage you, if you've trusted in the Lord but have not yet been baptized today, let yours truly know so that you might submit to the command of the Lord Jesus and be baptized. Will you please join me for the pastoral prayer? Our Father in God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, our helper, our comforter, Holy Spirit, we declare and believe in our hearts that you alone are God. You are the thrice holy God. You alone are infinite, independent, and immortal. We affirm that you are glorious, that you are blessed, that you are perfect, You are the eternal, immutable, incomprehensible God, and yet you have seen fit to reveal yourself to creation. You reveal yourself in creation, and you reveal yourself to creation through the word, both incarnate and written. You are everywhere, but you are not everything. You are the almighty maker of all things and knower of all things. You are wise and righteous, O God. We affirm that you are good all the time. And therefore you do good all the time. You are most merciful and gracious. You are long-suffering and patient. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are God. We individually and collectively confess that we are not God. We are not God. And so we ask that you would grant us forgiveness, that you would have mercy on us for seeking our own glory above yours. We ask that you would have mercy on us, Father, in and through the person and work of your beloved Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, by your Holy Spirit. And as we ask that, we have confidence that you indeed do have mercy on us in and through the person and work of your beloved Son, 
and by the Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask that you would grant the following petitions according to your will. We pray for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead peaceful and quiet lives, godly and dignified in every way. Specifically, we pray for our president, our governor, and the city officials represented in our midst. Grant salvation, O God, we ask, to those who are ungodly, that they might serve you in the positions that you have placed them in. Grant strength and wisdom to those who are godly, that they might continue to serve you and to serve you well in the positions that you have placed them in. We pray for the universal church, and we affirm that every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ makes up your body. We're thankful for the universal church, and we pray for local churches, the local tr churches that are faithful to your word in this city and in this state and in this nation and in this world. Strengthen them. Encourage them. Help them, O oh Lord. We especially pray for our local church, Redeem South Bay. We ask that by your grace we may be in the world, but not of it, and that we may bear the name of Christ well. We pray for missionaries and ministry workers who have gone around the world to preach the gospel of grace in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for our friends who are missionaries who have visited recently or who we know through previous churches or through previous engagements. We pray for them even now, asking that you would help and encourage and strengthen them. We especially thank you for Lauren Koval. We ask that you would strengthen her inner man and cause her not to grow weary in doing good, but rather to abide in you and to joyfully serve you, O oh God. Above all, we pray that you would help her to cling to Christ in all things, knowing that you have clung to her. We pray for those in our midst who are caring for their aging parents. We specifically pray for Linda Bryan, who is in North Carolina, helping her father Gunther, Gunther as he trans transitions to another care facility. We ask for health and strength for Gunther and protection and wisdom for Linda. Finally, we pray for those who are sick or hurting in our midst. We ask that you quickly bring both physical and spiritual restoration to those in need in our midst. We know there are many. Now, Father, as we present our offerings to you and prepare to partake of the Lord's table, help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. It is in the name of your beloved Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that we pray all these things as we anticipate participating in his table. Amen.
Luke chapter 22, verses 19 and 20 capture some of Jesus' actions and words as he instituted the Lord's Supper. The text reads, And he, Jesus, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Beloved, we participate in the Lord's table in remembrance of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We don't just participate as individuals, but we participate in the Lord's table as a communal group of individual living stones being built up as a spiritual house to remember Christ as the head of our house. This morning I would like us to remember Christ in the reciting of Christological portions of ancient creeds and confessions. Please consider the following biblical truths concerning Christ offered first in the Apostles' Creed, and then in the Nicene Creed, and lastly the Augsburg Confession. On Christ, the Apostles' Creed reads... I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only begotten Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He ascended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. On Christ, the Nicene Creed states, I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation, came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures. And he ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father. He shall come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. Lastly, on Christ, the Augsburg Confession states, the Word, that is, the Son of God, did assume the human nature in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, so that there are two natures, the divine and the human, inseparably enjoined in one person, one Christ, true God, and true man who was born of the Virgin Mary, truly suffered, was crucified, dead, and buried, that he might reconcile the Father unto us and be a sacrifice, not only for original guilt, but also for all actual sins of men. He also descended into hell and truly rose again the third day. Afterward, he ascended into heaven that he might sit on the right hand of the Father and forever reign and have dominion over all creatures and sanctify them that believe in him by sending the Holy Ghost into their hearts to rule, comfort, and quicken them and to defend them against the devil and the power of sin. The same Christ shall openly come again to judge the quick and the dead. Beloved, this is Jesus Christ the God-man, our Lord and Savior. And we remember him this morning as we partake of the bread and the cup. Give thanks with me. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the clarity of Scripture that allows us to affirm 
the truths within those creeds and confessions. We trust, we believe, and we rest in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we remember him now as we partake of the bread and the cup. Be glorified, we ask in Jesus' name. Take the bread. Likewise, take the cup. Father, as we continue in the worship service, we ask that you, by your Spirit, would help us to see Christ, to be quickened by your Spirit, to behold and live in light of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray for our preacher this morning. We ask that you would grant him strength to communicate clearly from your word and that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to follow. We need to hear the truth of your word, Lord. So help your man in this pulpit proclaim the truth and the power of the spirit that we might be changed and conformed to the image of Christ increasingly. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. At this time, if you would please pass your cups to the center aisle. There will be someone to collect them, and you can stand and greet one another. You are free to release your children to redeem kids if they're fifth grade and below, but as always, they are welcome to stay in the worship service auditorium as well. So we got all our kids in their classrooms now and ready to go. Gives us a number of extra chairs to sit in. That's good. There's a couple of announcements here that we want to give to you. Uh, Men's Summit is coming up, so it's time to sign up. It's going to be April 19th through the 21st at Pinecrest Christian uh, Conference in Twin Peaks, California. Uh, the speaker is going to be uh, Garen Bryan, who is Pastor Kevin's brother. Yay. Uh, it's $155. It includes four meals and two nights. Uh, if, if there's a problem with getting uh, the money for it, uh, talk to one of the elders, and we'll see what we can do about it. I'm sure we can get you there. Uh, the Women's Spring Brunch is Saturday, April the 27th, uh, 10 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. So if you sign up today or by email, uh, email uh, Jane O at the address in the bulletin, and uh, she'll get you fixed up for that. Uh, for those of you who are visiting us, uh, we have a plurality of elders, and therefore you get to see or hear a different elder pre- preaching every week. Uh, Today we're going to hear from Jeff Alfasa, but before that, please stand and we'll sing one more worship song. Love this song because it just reminds us that uh, all we have is Christ. Sometimes we live through this life and we think we have all these things, the nicest car, the biggest house most money in our bank account and all that stuff is fleeting and one day we'll all be gone and all we have or not have at the end of our life when we meet the Lord is Christ and uh, so it's just good to be reminded of that and thank the Lord that we do and only have Christ Sin that 
the strength to follow your command could never come from me. Oh, Father, use my ransom life in any way to choose. Let my song forever be my only boast in you. Good morning, church. Let's open our Bibles to Genesis chapter 7. We are back into the book of Genesis. We took a two-week break, and I could tell that you guys could not wait to get back into Genesis. You said, wait, wait, we just, we, we stopped right as he was told to build the ark. What happens next? You guys have been waiting on the edge of your seats. Some of you went ahead and read ahead. Good for you guys. But let's study this text together. I'm excited to be in it with you. If you grab the Bible uh, under the chair in front of you, it, it should be on page five. Is that correct? Someone who did that already? Page five. And we're going to begin reading uh, in verse one of, of chapter seven. But as you turn there, I just want to re remind you, I think three verses from chapter six will help help us just summarize the content of that chapter. We, we saw in verse 11, now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and the earth was filled with violence. And verse 12 says that God saw the earth, behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And then he told him to go and make for yourself an ark. And then he gave him instructions on how to build that ark, dimensions uh, and instructions as well to bring and to take in animals into the ark with him. And it says that Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. So let's pick up in chapter seven, verse one now. The word of God reads, then the Lord said to Noah, go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, the male and his mate, and a pair of the animals that are not clean, the male and his mate, and seven pairs of the birds of the heavens also, male and female, to keep their offspring alive on the face of all the earth. For in seven days I will send rain on the earth forty days and forty nights, and every living thing that I have made I will blot out from the face of the ground. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters came upon the earth. And Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him went into the ark to escape the waters of the flood. Of clean animals and of, and of animals that are not clean and of birds and of everything that creeps on the ground, two and two, male and female, went into the ark with Noah as God had commanded Noah. 
And after seven days, the waters of the flood came upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth and the windows of the heavens were opened and rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. On the very same day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with him, with them entered the ark. They and every beast according to its kind and all the livestock according to their kinds and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth according to its kind and every bird according to its kind, every winged creature. They went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh in which there was the breath of life. And those that entered, male and female, of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him. And the Lord shut him in. The flood continued 40 days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep. And all flesh died that moved on the earth. Birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth and all mankind. Everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we come before you, Lord, and this is equally and simultaneously such an extraordinary passage that is so helpful to instruct us. And at the same time, Lord, it is a sobering, humbling, terrifying passage. Lord, we believe that the things that you have written in your word are true. And we believe, Lord, that all that you do is just and righteous. And Lord, we are just amazed that you made a way for us through your son to be reconciled to you, to be forgiven, to have our sins paid for, that by faith we could be counted righteous and that we could be welcomed by you, that we could find favor in your eyes, O oh Lord, just as Noah did that we could be a people, Lord, who are assured of your rescue and a people who are righteous heralds of your gospel. So Lord, we pray that you would do a great work in our hearts, that you would draw us near to you, that we would have a bigger view of you, Lord, uh, that we'd have a more accurate view of ourselves and our world and our history, oh God and that your word would rightly instruct our hearts. We ask this in Jesus' mighty name, amen. Can, can you imagine how impactful this event would be on you and on the stories that you would tell and on the instruction that you would give to your children if you went through this? Noah will come through this flood and God will rescue Noah and his family. And according to the scriptures, all the nations of the earth, everyone in this room 
will trace their lineage back to this single family. And, and so you can just imagine when Noah and his sons and their sons' wives and they start to have kids and they start to have kids and they start to have kids and they're sitting around at the dinner table and they're sitting around the fire and they're instructing one another and they're thinking about the world and they're thinking about God. Could there be, apart from creation, could there be a more impactful, a, a, a more uh, important thing to describe and to talk about and to pass on to your children than the history of the flood. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that uh, speaking of some of the incidents in the Old Testament, he says that these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Do you know that the instruction that we can get from this text is exceedingly helpful for every generation to know what God is like, to know what man is like, to know that the wages of sin is death, to know that God is holy, to know that God is just, to know that God must punish sin, to to know that he will, and to know that there's also his grace and that he's willing to save, and that he's willing to rescue, and that he'll do that if you put your trust in him. That's helpful for every generation, amen? And that's also especially helpful for us, who Paul says, are, are the end of the ages has come. Why? Because there's an analogous future tribulation that is going to be unleashed on this earth that the scriptures talk about. And so the same lessons that we can take and learn from Noah's life are exceedingly helpful for us as we consider what God has said to us and the judgment that he has promised and the salvation also that he has promised. It's interesting that if you you look into it, you see cultures around the whole world, even if they don't have all the details exactly the same as the scriptures, this is one of their main memories. Anthropologists studied this and interviewed people all across the world, all sorts of different tribes, all sorts of people, like we even have access to some of these people, and now they have access, and you learn a little bit about their history, and all of them have passed on this story of a flood. And you could, you could just smile when you think about that. Because that's exactly what you would expect for something so monumental. That even as people spread out across the whole world, they have a collective memory of this moment. Even if some of the details and some of the places get lost or left out or changed or, or tweaked. And so this, this should encourage us that these are true words, historical words. This is a historical event. This really happened. And even on the, the cultures across the world testify to it themselves. And so let's think about the implications of this text. This text has what I'm describing as inescapable conclusions that we must draw from it that are significant for our lives and affect how we live. They're given to us. And th- we have this so that we can be informed in our minds and transformed in our thinking and renewed in our affections and redirected in our living. That's the power of this story. That's the power of this event in this history, and that's the power of scripture as it's been written down and preserved and given to us. And so what are these two inescapable conclusions? We could talk about a lot of different things in this passage, but I want to focus on two inescapable conclusions. And the reason for that is so that we will have faith in God 
and so that we will be righteous and fearless heralds of the gospel in an evil generation. So let's begin with the first inescapable conclusion. I do not think that you can read this text and not come to the conclusion that God knows how to rescue the righteous. You just can't do it. You have to walk away when you hear this and when you have it read that God knows how to rescue the righteous. And we're going we're gonna to see that as we, we work through a number of these subpoints, some of the different actions of God that God sees and God speaks and God sends and God saves. God knows how to rescue the righteous. And the second point that we'll get to, the second inescapable conclusion is that God knows how to repay the wicked. You cannot get through this text and come to some conclusion other than that. And this also is seen in the similar actions of God, that God sees, that God speaks, and that God sends. And so I want to walk through those, prove those to you, and draw some applications from those, from those inescapable conclusions. And so let's begin with the first inescapable conclusion about God when we read Genesis chapter 7. That is that God knows how to rescue the righteous. And so this off the top should be a source of incredible encouragement and comfort to you. That if, if you're seeking to be faithful and you're seeking to be righteous and you're trying to have believe God and take him at his word, then you're exactly the type of person that God rescues. That's who he delights and glorifies himself in rescuing. God knows how to rescue the righteous. How do we know that? How can we prove that? This text proves it. And it starts with this, that God sees. God, if God didn't see and God didn't know the things that were happening on the earth and the things that are happening to the righteous and the things that are happening to you, then you might not have much, very much confidence that God could actually rescue But what we see is that God is not a God who just set up the earth and then walked away from it. But he's a God who set up the earth, upholds the earth, is actively involved in it. He sees all that is taking place on it. Do you remember Genesis 1? When God created, he caused the light to come and he saw that it was good. When he made the earth and the seas, he saw that it was good. When he had the plants and the fruit trees bearing seeds according to their kinds, he saw and it was good. And then he made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock and every, all the things that creep on the ground. And God, what? He saw that it was good. And he saw in chapter 1, verse 31, everything that he made. And behold, it was very good. Is God a God who's blind? Is God a God who, God who, uh, you know, who cannot see? Can he not see what you're going through? Can he not see uh, everything that is taking place on the earth? Of course he can. In chapter 2, verse 19, God even brought the animals to man to see what he would call them. And whatever man called every living creature, that was its name. And if we keep going with this and paying attention to it, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 8, it says that Noah found favor, what? In the eyes of the Lord. God saw Noah. God saw Noah and he sees you. Genesis 6 verse 9, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. God saw Noah. And look at verse, uh, chapter 7 verse 1 of our passage. Then the Lord said to Noah, go in the ark, you and all your household, for what? I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. And so does God see? Does he really see? Does he really know what's going on? Does he really know all the details that are happening on this earth? Can he see and penetrate into your heart and into mine? Can he see if you have faith in him? Can he see whether you're living a righteous life? 
Can he see that you're clinging on to him and his word, even though it's costing you, even though people are laughing at you, even though people are mocking you, even though everyone in the world is is joined together uh, in agreement that you're the idiot. God sees. He sees it all. He sees us. He knows how to rescue the righteous. And that's shown to us by the fact that he sees Next, though, we see that God knows how to rescue the righteous because he not only sees, but he also speaks. He also speaks. In our passage, we see the things that God gave Noah uh, to do, he, that he spoke to Noah. It says, in, we, when we look at verses 1 through 4, we, we read that he said, go into the ark. If God just saw that Noah was righteous and didn't say, or do anything else, how would Noah be saved? But God not only sees, but then he also speaks and he communicates and he tells Noah exactly what to do. So he sees the righteous and he speaks to the righteous and tells the righteous what to do. Go into the ark, you and all your household. And then take with you seven pairs of all the the clean animals, the male and his mate, and the pair of animals that are not clean. And then down in verse four, for in seven days, I will send rain on the earth 40 days and 40 nights and every living thing that I have made, I will blot out from the face of the ground. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. So the Lord saw Noah and then he spoke to Noah and he told Noah what was going to happen. And then he told Noah what to do. And then what did Noah do? All that God told him to do. And God saw that too, amen? God sees the righteous and God speaks and he reveals things to them. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse seven, it says, by faith, Noah being warned by God. Warned by God. That's speech, that's communication, that's words. Noah, by faith, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. And now see how this is an amazing thing, that God will tell of future judgment and he will give warning of that and he'll tell his righteous what to do in light of that. And that is all an opportunity for the righteous to show what? That they truly believe, that they truly trust God and that they truly are gonna do what God says. And so God is a God who not only sees, but he's a God who speaks. And because he sees and because he speaks, we can be assured that he knows how to rescue. I mean, it would be, it would be, it would be sad if God saw that Noah's simple, faithful, righteous man trusting in him. And then God said, Noah, this flood is going to come. Get up and build this ark, and you're going to be safe from it. But then, oh, actually, you got destroyed in the flood and died too. God would be a liar. He would be breaking his word. Uh, And in that case, it would show us that he doesn't know how to rescue and so God not only sees, he not only speaks, but he, but he also then sends. He sends forth what he spoke. He sends the judgment that he is warned about. And we see this in verses 6 through 12. And all of this is helping us to see that God knows how to rescue the righteous. He sends this judgment. It really comes. Verse 6 through 12, it says, Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters came upon the earth. What did God say was going to happen? He said that floodwaters were about to come upon the earth. And he told Noah and his his family to get in the ark. And verse seven says, Noah and his sons and his wives and his son's wives went into the ark to what? Escape. Escape the waters of the flood. They're listening to God and they are escaping the flood. Verse eight uh, mentions in nine that the animals were then taken on it uh, into the ark with him. And after seven days, the waters of the flood came upon the earth. God sent the judgment just as he promised, just as he warned, just as he spoke to Noah. 
And it says, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened, and rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. This is what God said would happen. And what's interesting here is, is I, I think a number of things in this state, verses 11 and 12, are amazing. But when we, we, we get a chronological marker to indicate for us when exactly this flood was sent by God. It says that this was in the 600th year of Noah's life. And we don't just get the year of Noah's life. We also get what? The month and the day. That's pretty impressive for a, a, you know, some like 5,000, 4,000, 5,000 year old text or account that's being recorded. We get not only a year, but a month and a specific day. It's almost like someone wrote this down. When it says that Noah, it was Noah's 600th year of life, is that figurative for something? Was he really 600 years old? How many 600-year-old people have you met and talked to? You believe that? He was 600-year-old? Amen. Yeah, well, I believe that. 100% I believe that. And it fits in with all the other old ages from Adam down to Noah. And, and you, have a, you have a decreasing uh, longevity as you go through the Torah, as you start with Genesis, and you go from Adam to Noah, and then you go to the, 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 the it, look at the genealogies and the, the total numbers of years that the patriarchs live uh, before the flood and then after the flood, and then you trace the ages of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then eventually you get to Moses. And so by the end, but from the beginning, you have man living about 900 years, and then down to the end, Moses, how old is Moses when he dies? 120 years old. And so you have this decreasing over thousands of years, decreasing uh, uh, age that is, that is taking place. And so I 100% believe that Noah truly was 600 years old. Uh, and, and so in the 600th year of his life, in the second month, On the 17th day of the month, this is when God sent this flood. And it says that all the fountains of the deep, of the great deep burst forth and the windows of the heavens were opened and rain fell on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, This past Monday, we had the privilege of taking the loft group to see the Ark and the Darkness movie, uh, which was just showing a couple nights. You'll probably be able to stream it in a a month or two. but this was a, just an incredible movie to, to watch and to just think through all the different elements and the, the different aspects of this account and, and how, would that, how would that work and what would be the implications of that and, and all these different uh, aspects. But one of the things that it, it, it mentioned was uh, just this idea of the great deeps bursting for, forth, how you could see on, on, you can see these these ridges in the in the oceans that are like look like a a, a baseball stitch uh, that something had been bursted at the seams uh, and they can they can see these things now uh, and uh, another thing that's kind of come up in the last five to ten years ha- has been these uh, discoveries of water beneath the surface of the earth. By some estimates, three times the amount, three times the volume of water in our oceans is beneath the earth. And so it's pretty amazing that you can have a statement like this, and maybe you don't even, I don't even know what that all means, right? Uh, but the great deep burst forth. But we have, living where we live today, evidences of, of such a thing. It's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. And so this is, this is the account. This is how God sent forth this flood 
the great deep burst forth, windows of the heaven were opened, and rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. So God not only saw, but he also spoke, and he also then sent what he warned about. And this then leads to the last reason we know that God knows how to rescue the righteous, and that's that he saves. If he sees and he speaks and he sins, but then he doesn't save, that would be the worst possible situation for us in our understanding of God. Because that would mean that Noah dies, and if Noah and his family die, what happens to the rest of us? Where'd you come from again? You died too, <laughs> if you could put it that way. But God saves. And, and here's where you, you're reading this and you're thinking, oh, this is old and oh, this is that thing. And, but you have to realize that God preserving Noah, and if you're related, your lineage goes back to this one family, then God's preservation of Noah was also a preservation of the future you. How personal is this text now? It's amazing. God is a God who saves. God is God who rescues. God is God who delivers. And we see this in, in, as we keep reading. We look at verse 13 through 16. It says, On the very same day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife, and the, their three wives uh, of his sons with them entered the ark, and every beast according to its kind, all the livestock according to their kinds, the creeping things that creep on the earth according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, every winged creature, they went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh in which there was the breath of life, and those that entered, male and female, of all flesh, went in as God commanded him. And what does it say next? And the Lord shut him in. It's like God came and shut the door on the ark himself. You're going to be safe in here. Come. Come. Rest for a little while while I put my hand over you and cover you and protect you and allow you to have your life and those with you saved and preserved to become a new seed, new man on a new earth. The Lord shut him in. We also see in verse 23, if we jump down there, it says that God blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark. And so God knows how to rescue the righteous. He sees and he speaks uh, and he sends and he saves all just as he has promised. God knows how to rescue the righteous. Listen to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20. Peter says that, speaking of, these, speaking of angels, he says, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through the water. How were they brought through the water? Safely. Does God know how to rescue? Yeah, absolutely. The fountains of the deep can break open. The, the whole earth can be, can be flooded and everything can be covered. And yet, while there's all this death and destruction surrounding this one family, yet they are brought safely through. God knows how to rescue you. God knows how to rescue me. This is what he's, this is what he does. Listen again, 2 Peter. You, you almost get the idea that this was an important incident, an event in history for Peter, an important event for our theology. He talks about it in both of his letters. In the second one, he says uh, in verse, chapter two, verse five, that if God did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah. And then he goes on and, and 
and says a couple other things. It says, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. And then he, he goes on and makes, makes a point from that. But when we read this, what do we see? The ancient world was what? Not spared. But what happened to Noah? He was preserved, right? Does God know how to rescue the righteous? Absolutely. And so this leads then to, I think, a, a, a just a clear point of application for us. Is this. If God knows how to rescue the righteous, then we have to realize faith and righteousness are rewarded. Faith and righteousness are rewarded. Was it worth it for Noah to believe, even if everyone around him was telling him he was a fool? Was it worth it to hold on to the word of God? Was it worth it to say, I will obey you? I will not be concerned with what men think of me. Was it worth it? Look at how he was rewarded. I mentioned to you that Noah is a, a picture of a, a righteous remnant preserved by God that then passes uh, that then passes through judgment or when judgment has passed, it's him and his people who will live and reign on a new earth. Do you see that? Is that not also the case for us? That by faith in God, by faith in Christ, that we will ourselves be rescued from the coming wrath that God is going to unleash on this earth and be brought safely to a new earth in the future after that wrath is poured out. Is that not exactly what this, the scriptures teach and what Jesus says? And so we have to understand this. Faith and righteousness are rewarded. And so if you're here and you're not a believer in Jesus Christ yet, I would just plead with you, see, just see these things. You have to know God and it will rescue the righteous. And all you have to do is to turn from sin and by faith believe in Jesus Christ and you will be considered in God's sight as righteous. And if you'll do that, then you can have full assurance that he's gonna rescue you when his wrath breaks out in the time to come. Faith and righteousness are rewarded. Listen to this quote from Eusebius. I found this really interesting. This came from... Uh, uh, a book that came out a year or two ago by uh, Lee Brainerd. And he, he said, this is a Eusebius quote that he had found. It says, quote, Indeed, as all perished then, except those gathered with Noah in the ark, so also at his coming, speaking of Jesus' coming, the ungodly in the season of apostasy shall perish. At the time of deluge, it did not come and destroy all the inhabitants of the earth before or until Noah entered into the ark. Therefore, it is in the same way at the consummation of the age, uh, it, regarding to this pattern, says that the cataclysm of the destruction of the ungodly shall not happen before those men who are found of God at, the at that time are gathered into the ark and saved according to the pattern of Noah. All the righteous and godly are to be separated from the ungodly and gathered into the heavenly ark of God. And then he, he goes on, uh, for in this way, when not even one righteous man will be found anymore among mankind, and when all the ungodly have been made atheists by the Antichrist, and the whole world is overcome by apostasy, the wrath of God shall come upon the ungodly. But he says, the righteous are going to be in the ark. Does God know how to rescue the righteous? So if you're here, friend, who's not a believer in Jesus yet, you got to do one thing. Enter the ark. Get in the boat. Don't listen to them. Don't listen to any of them. You go into the ark. You trust in Christ. Pastor Kenny said, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. The only way to make it 
and be rescued from the wrath to come is to by, by faith be united to the son. So run to him and he will accept you and he will pardon you and he will protect you and he will deliver you. This is what God does. Faith and righteousness are rewarded. God knows how to rescue the righteous. I love Shane and Shane's song, You've Already Won. It says, the line says here, I know how the story ends. We will be with you again. You're my savior and my defense. No more fear in life or death. I know how the story ends. And so it's this that really allows us, I think, to be fearless heralds of the gospel, just like Noah was. When you understand that God rescues the righteous, then it doesn't matter what man can do to me. It doesn't matter what they might try to do to silence me, to tell me to shut up or, or to kill me. I know that God will raise me. He's gonna rescue me even from death and bring me into a new heaven and a new earth for all eternity. I could be bold. I could be alone. I could be laughed at, but I can be fearless because if I fear God, I don't need to fear man. I don't need to fear them. I need to fear for them. And if I fear for them, then I'll speak to them and tell them to get in the ark. Get in the ark. God knows how to rescue the righteous. This is an inescapable conclusion of our text. This leads to the second one then, and that's that God knows how to repay the wicked. God knows how to repay the wicked. He knows how to rescue the righteous and that is good and that is comforting and that is life-changing and that is helpful and instructive and should change the way that we live to make us fear, fearless heralds of the gospel. But we have to also understand and recognize that we cannot escape the conclusion that God knows how to repay the wicked as well. And this passage is not only a passage about rescuing righteous but also about repaying the wicked. And we know that God knows how to repay the wicked because once again, God sees. God not only saw Noah, but he also saw the wicked. Verse one said that, go into the ark, you and all your household, for I've seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. So God knows both what Noah is up to and the rest of the people as well. If we go back a little bit further in the narrative in Genesis 6 verse 5, it says that the Lord saw what? That the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Jumping down to verse 12, God saw the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. So God not only sees the righteous, he also what? sees the wicked. If God can't see the wicked and if God can't identify the wicked and if God doesn't know who's doing right and who's doing bad, how can he be a judge? How can he give out justice? How can he give out in a proper amount? How can he give to each one according to what their deeds deserve if he doesn't see and know what they're doing? But God does see and he does know and nothing escapes his sight. But we also see that God is a God who not only sees the wicked, but he's also a God who speaks and even warns the wicked. Even though there's no voice from heaven given to the wicked, even though there's not probably the sort of personal direct communication that Noah enjoyed when God spoke to Noah, we saw that 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, Peter called Noah a herald of righteousness. And so what was Noah doing after God spoke to Noah? Noah was heralding. He was preaching. He was speaking to others. He was building, right, and preaching. And his building was also preaching, you could say. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> what are you working on, Noah? I'm working on the ark. You need to get on this thing with me because there's a flood coming. God's gonna punish the evil that has been taking place on the earth. You need to repent of your sins. You need to come and you need to flee from his wrath. And the only place that you can do that is onto this ark with me. Come with me, come with me. Noah is a herald of righteousness. And so while not everyone on the earth might have heard God speak audibly, many of them would have been able to 
hear Noah's preaching. And this is what God does. He raises up prophets. He raises up heralds, messengers, and he uses them to tell people, repent, turn from your sin. Come live for God. God will forgive you, but you have to turn. Turn and live and enter the ark. So God sees and God speaks and God also sends. All of this shows us that he knows how to repay the wicked. Once again, if God saw all the evil and the violence and then said that he was going to punish it, but then never punished it, he wouldn't be perfectly faithful. He wouldn't be perfectly true. He would break his word and he wouldn't be God. But God sees and he speaks and he also sends. He sends the judgment that he warns about. It will come. It will come. If it delays, that's just more time for you to help others get ready for its coming. God sends what he has promised. Look at verses uh, verses 17. Let's get, turn, or turn down to verse 17 with me and we see God send the flood. And we, we can take notice here of some of the details uh, of, of, that are given in the text that tells us what this flood was like when God sent it. And I passed over some, some of these a little bit earlier, but here in this, this last section, it tells us how long, how deep, how wide, and how deadly the waters of the flood were. Now, when Pastor Kenny saw my outline, he thought that I was going somewhere else with that uh, until he saw the how deadly part. Uh, this is, it's true that God's love is, you know, how long, how deep, how wide is God's love for us, amen? amen. And that's why he rescues the righteous. But it's also true that when he judges the wicked, his judgment is also long, deep, wide, deadly inescapably so. Look at verse 17. How long? It says the flood continued 40 days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark and it rose high above the earth. Verse 24 says the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. Chapter 8 verse 3 says the waters receded from the earth continually and at the end of 150 days the waters had abated. And so at the very minimum, you have some 350, 370 days that you have this event taking place, including the time when waters are receding. How deep is this judgment that God sends of the, with this flood? Verse 17 says that the flood continued 40 days on the earth, and the waters increased and bore up the ark. And it rose high above the earth. Can you just picture that? The whole earth, a watery globe. Nothing. You can see nothing. If you were to see it from like, you know, super far away, you can see nothing but a bunch of blue or dark. And if, say, the clouds cleared, all you would see is just that tiny speck, that arc, the boat right there, floating above at the top, safely brought through the event of judgment. Verse 18, it says, Waters prevailed increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the waters. And verse 19, the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. And then it says, The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep, which is about... 22 feet above the highest peak of the highest mountain. That's how deep this flood was. And we not only see how how deep it was, but also how wide. Verse 19, to read it again, says that the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. And I think it's that there's a key phrase for us to pay attention to when it describes all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. I think we get not only a, a, a statement about the depth of the flood, but also the breadth or the width of the flood or how far did, what sort of region did this flood cover? Uh, it didn't just cover one small region, it covered the whole earth. 
Look at how it says, it describes this. All the high mountains under the whole what? Heaven. If you're to divide creation into heaven and earth, and you want to talk about everything on the earth, then one of the ways that you can do that is to is by saying everything under heaven. Could you think of a better way to say that? How, what's, what, what more of a comprehensive term would you would you hope for here to communicate this idea? The 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 the, the the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. Uh, in John Whitcomb and Henry Morris's book, The Genesis Flood, they share a quote from Herbert Leopold. And I just want to read this to you. This is what he says concerning this verse, Genesis 7, verse 19. He says that a measure of the waters is now made by comparison with the only available standard for such waters, the mountains. They are said to have been covered, not, not a few merely, but all the high mountains under all the heavens. One of these expressions alone would almost necessitate the impression that the author intends to convey the idea of the absolute universal, universality of the flood. Yet since all is known to be used in a relative sense, the writer removes all possible ambiguity by adding the phrase, under all the heavens. A double all, or the Hebrew word kol, cannot allow for so relative a sense. It almost constitutes a Hebrew superlative. So we believe that the text disposes of the question of the universality of the flood. By way of objection to this interpretation, those who believe in a limited flood, which extended perhaps as far as mankind, uh, may have penetrated at that time, they urge the fact that kol, or this all, is used in a relative sense, as is clearly the cases in such passages as Genesis 41, 57, Exodus 9, 25, 10, 15, Deuteronomy 2, 25, and 1 Kings 10, 24. However, we still insist that this fact could overthrow a single kol, or all, never a double kol, or double all, as our verse has it. And so, you get the idea that this is a universal flood. How deep was it to submerge the highest hills on the earth? How wide to submerge all of the highest hills across the whole face of the whole earth, geographically universal? And this then leads lastly to how deadly. In regards to how deadly, we cannot come to any other conclusion except that it was anthropologically universal. Or in other words, that it affected all mankind. The language that is used in these verses not only says that it was worldwide, but that it was comprehensive and total for every single living person on the earth. And there's only one place of refuge. There's no hills, there's no tips of the mountain that you can hide in. There's only one place of refuge, and that's the ark. Everything outside of the ark died. Look at verses 21 to 23. It says, And all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, and all mankind, everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life, died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground. Man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, they were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those with him in the ark. Do you see? Does that mean, reading that, does that mean there was a few people who made it outside the ark? Even one person, one person made it outside of the ark? No. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark. The universal extent of the flood is clearly communicated in this passage. It was universally deadly. Jesus says in Matthew 24, if you don't want to take Moses' word for it, listen to Jesus tell you what Moses said. 
Matthew 24, verse 37 says, For as it was in the days of Noah, so will, be, uh, the, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So it will be with the coming of the Son of Man. What did Jesus say? Who did Jesus say was swept away? Swept them all away. In the passage in Luke, Jesus says, until the day uh, when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Is that just a, par- a portion of humanity or that's all humanity outside the ark? And listen to Peter again in 1 Peter 3. He says that God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. So how many persons made it safely through the water, church? Eight persons. Good job. Peter says again in his next book, if God did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others. This one's tricky. (laughs) When he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. So how many were spared? How many were brought safely through? Noah plus seven equals You guys are killing it. You make Jesus proud. Believe his words. Jesus says, if if you believed Moses, you would believe me. You get it? They're on the same page. This thing really happened, and we need to really learn from it. Because Jesus ties it and says, this is exactly analogous to the situation that's going to be like on the earth right before I come. And you need to warn people concerning it. God knows how to repay the wicked. He doesn't only see, he doesn't only speak, but he also sends. And when he sends, he judges. And not a single person will escape his judgment. God knows how to repay the wicked. This is an inescapable conclusion. And so I think that there's two ways that we should apply that truth to our lives. One is if you have been the victim of any injustice, any injustice, any violence, any bloodshed, any horrific sinning that has taken place against you, you should be comforted and relieved by the fact that there is coming a day when there will be justice. There's no evil deed done in the whole earth that will not be held accountable by God. God knows how to repay the wicked and he repays them according to their deeds. And so that frees us up once again to to not have to be vengeful, to not have to try to retaliate, to not try to take justice into our own hands. But what does God say? Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay And so any of you who are thinking, no, I'm going to repay. I'm going to make this right. You're stepping on God's toes. You got no business doing that. He says, you leave room for the wrath of God. I'm going to repay. So you're free. You're so free. Just be a bold, righteous, fearless herald until they take your head off. Preach and love. And you don't have to retaliate. You know that God is just. And so that's a relief for the righteous. But it's also at the same time, a terrifying, humbling, sobering warning to the wicked. Justice will be satisfied. That's true. And that's a relief for the righteous. But sinners will be judged. And that is a warning to the wicked. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the only way any of us are made righteous is through the faith in Christ and having his righteousness counted to us so that God sees us as if we lived the perfect, righteous life of Jesus. And the warning, none of us us were, were, were born here Christians. All of us who have become Christians were, were the wicked who had been warned. And by God's grace, we believed and we heeded that warning. And we were moved and we were saved and we became sinners who are saved because Christ was judged in our place. He bore the wrath that we deserve for our sins in his body 
on the tree so that we could be forgiven and so that God could be just and also the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Justice will be satisfied and sinners will be judged. This is a warning to the wicked. If you're here and you haven't fled, if you haven't fled from God's wrath, haven't fled into the ark, you haven't fled to Christ, please hear this warning. God knows how to repay the wicked and it's inescapable. You can, you can only think, oh, I'm gonna put this off, but every, every moment that you spend putting this off is another moment where you're just storing up more wrath against yourself for the day of judgment. So, so here, and pl- I plead with you, turn from your sin and run to him. Run to him for life. He's so eager to forgive you, so willing to, to blot out instead of you all your transgressions because Christ died for you. So run to him. Heed this warning. We plead with you. God knows how to repay the wicked. Malachi chapter four, verse one and two puts it this way. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings, and you shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. What was it like when Noah got off that ark with his family? Who was leaping higher, Noah or the calves? I don't know. And so it will be with us who have put our faith in Christ, who have endured, who have held on to the Lord, who have waited, who listened to what he said, who warned others, who told people what was to come. God knows how to rescue the righteous. And we are going to live and reign with him on a new earth for all eternity. Father, we praise you. This is such good news, Lord, because we we see, Father, that the wages of sin is death, and we see, Lord, that, that we... We have no way, Lord, to prolong and to preserve our lives, O oh God. And we have no way, O oh Lord, to, to clean ourselves or to cleanse ourselves or to, to wash ourselves, Lord, uh, and to make ourselves right before you. But we're wholly dependent upon your mercy and your grace and the offering of your son for our sins. He alone is our refuge. He alone is our hope. He alone is our assurance of salvation. He alone is, is the one who, who, by whom we can enter and be saved. So Lord, we ask that you would please help us to live faithful, righteous lives, who, that, that we would be heralds of your gospel, that we would be fearless, O oh Lord, in doing so, even while we wait people, uh, even while we wait for your judgment to come and warn people. Lord, bless our ministry in that way. Strengthen us, oh God, for that task. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Sing how amazing that God is who does rescue. We know how deep and how wide and how great is his love.
to give you a quote from George Mueller. He says, my business is with all my might to serve my own generation. In doing so, I shall best serve the next generation. Should the Lord Jesus tarry. The longer I live, the more I'm able to realize that I have but one life to live on earth and that this one life is but a brief life for sowing in comparison with eternity, for reaping. Go be heralds of righteousness this, this, this week, church, and don't be discouraged by the responses. How many people went on the ark with Noah? Seven. Seven. Good job. <laughs> told you it's tricky. (laughs) Let's leave you with this benediction. Now may the Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. And Redeem South Bay said, Amen. amen. God bless you. Please join us outside for some time of fellowship and food. Have a good week.